Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's talk by visiting artist Daniel Joseph Martinez. Each year, SAC's Visiting Artists Program hosts a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. It's an honor to welcome Daniel Joseph Martinez to SAC, and I would like to thank him for his generosity and for sharing his work with all of us this evening. This program is presented in collaboration with the Office of the Dean of Graduate Studies, and I would like to thank Dean Arnold Kemp for his partnership. I'd like to invite you to join Daniel Joseph Martinez for a conversation tomorrow afternoon with Dina Hagag, President and CEO of United States Artists, and Inigo Manalo Ovale, artist and professor of art theory and practice at Northwestern University. This event will be moderated by Arnold Kemp and will take place tomorrow at 4.30 in SAC's Leroy Neiman Center on the first floor. If there's time later this evening, we will take a few questions from the audience and our staff will circulate microphones for your use. However, in the event that we run out of time, I highly encourage you to attend tomorrow's conversation so you can ask some questions then. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Arnold Kemp, SAC's Dean of Graduate Studies, to introduce Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. This is. Um uh, I've been a great partnership, and thank you for you to you and your staff for all the organizing um, and organizing the studio visits and hosting Daniel today. I had a really full plate today, so I couldn't welcome my great friend face to face when he arrived. But it's a distinct honor and a pleasure to um, welcome Daniel Joseph Martinez who is a distinguished professor of art and graduate studies at the University of California in Irvine. Daniel and I first met in 1992 in San Francisco, believe it or not. <laughs> and since then, Daniel has been the sort of mentor and friend that if I had not known him, I don't think I would be standing in front of you today. His work as an artist and teacher has paved the way and cleared obstacles to my vision so that I could project myself into having a sustainable life in the arts. Um, I want to personally thank Daniel for that. I always call him. <laughs> uh, while Daniel is an artist, artist who works in installation, photography, performance, public art, and new media, I think he is more interested in research and asking questions than producing products and objects that stand in for adequate answers. In fact, I have never felt that Daniel is interested in just the adequate. In his work, he persistently returns to a series of unanswerable questions. He asks, he asks whether history is being written in terms of the economy, the free market, and the corporate museum, and how artists and individuals can organize an evolving, self-sustaining aesthetic to counter the prevalent paradigm. Setting these issues against a backdrop of political chaos and global instability, he asks whether autonomy is a state of being in which the dissolution of the self is part of the secularized belief in career, property, ownership, success, and coupling. To counter this, he asserts that belief itself can be a catalyst for creative change. An example of Daniel's belief in uh, cultural organizing and intervention is Deep River, which was a five-year project initiated by Daniel along with artists Rolo Castillo, Glenn Kaino, and Tracy Schiffman. Neither commercial or nonprofit space, Deep River was 325 square feet of exhibition space that presented an experimental laboratory conceived as a social sculpture. The Deep River space focused on local concerns, cultural diversity, and difference, putting forth an alternative model wherein temporality excused the logic of institutionalization. Deep River's embodiment of a collective and finite model which subverted the operations of both the museum and the market represents a significant contribution to the legacy of alternative spaces in LA and beyond. This is a space where I first saw the work of then fledgling artists, Mark Bradford, Corey Newkirk, and Glenn Kino. 
And I'm sure that when Daniel was working with a gallery in New York called The Project, that he also mentored artists that we know of, such as Julie Moretu. Another of intervention of Daniel's uh, was at the 1993 Whitney Biennial. It was titled Museum Tags, Second Movement Overture, or Overture con claque, Overture with Hired Audience Members, received critical attention and thrust him into the spotlight. His work has been exhibited worldwide at prestigious museums and galleries, including twice at the Whitney Biennial, at the Whitney Museum, in 1993 and 2008, the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Los Angeles, the International Center for Photography in New York, the Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Houston, the El, Mu El Museo del Barrio in New York, Instituto Cervantes in Madrid, Spain, and MoMA, New York, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, Michigan, among many, many others. Martinez represented the United States Pavilion at the 10th International Cairo Biennial in Cairo, Egypt, and the 12th Istanbul Biennial in Istanbul, Turkey. He received the United States Artist Fellowship in 2008, the Rasmussen Foundation, um, Alaska's Artist in Resident Award 2000, in 2009, and the Fellows of Contemporary Art Fellowship in 2010. In 2009, a monograph of his work titled A Life of Disobedience was published by Haja Kantz, and Daniel just returned recently to the United States and specifically to LA after doing a residency at the prestigious American Academy in Berlin. We are lucky to have Daniel visit us, so please welcome Daniel Joseph Martinez. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I uh, am told it's pouring rain outside, so I appreciate you, those of you who have made it through the rain. Uh, excuse me for one second. Uh, first, I would like to just um, a few acknowledgments. Um, uh, Andrea Pereiro and Elizabeth um, Anderson for uh, excellent and flawless orchestration and, uh, and bringing me here today for the talk. Um, it's a, it's a, you have a lot of speakers here and it's a, she does a, a kind of a, a perfect job of um, managing and coordinating the visits, at least in my case. Um, Arnold Kemp, uh, he's right, we seem to be tethered at the hip for uh, quite a long time now. Um, we have known each other for a very long time, but perhaps it was when he was in Portland and I had come to speak, we were able to sort of rekindle a friendship that, you know, sometimes distance and time and place um, is hard to, to negotiate because everyone has their own lives and following their own particular paths. Um, and then when he was at um, VCU, I, I was, I came to speak, but I had was at the edge of, my, I had just come out of a, a five-year illness, and you know, Arnold is so sweet. I mean, he has not only been supportive of the work and the ideas, but in that case, I was still, you know, probably falling apart. And you know, he just so gently helped me through my time there. And I promised him because I, I felt that I had under, I had come under my own bar in terms of. Uh, of presentations, and so I promised him I would have something very special for you tonight. So uh, I, I hope I, I uh, have something for you all to think about, and uh, Arnold particularly. Um, my good friend Indigo is here, whom we have known each other since about 91 or 92. Um, we were gonna speak tomorrow, which is, it's fantastic for us to be able to speak about something that is not, I would say not just topical, but is pressing currently. And then I just want to acknowledge um, my longtime friendship with Mary Jane Jacobs, whom I've been talking about art with Mary Jane for almost 30 years now. And perhaps what is unique about that, it's not, it was not just the idea of, of the discussion of art, but it was actually about trying to put ideas into practice. 
and at the point of of that was Culture in Action here in Chicago, which was, in I would still argue, was a groundbreaking set of ideas, which Indigo and I both were in, and that um, it, it is difficult when you're in, when you think of a, an entire city as a laboratory, and that the laboratory is, you are attempting to do that which is unknown, and so you take risks on ideas that are un, not only unprecedented, but would normally not garnish the kind of support necessary in order to, to manifest those things. And so, I, in, in my opinion, Mary Jane has always been a visionary and continues to be, and um, it, it just, it just so, someone I, I need to acknowledge. Um, but anyway, thank you all for being here, and uh, let's see. So, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm basically gonna tell a number of stories that make up one long narrative, and the narrative doesn't have a beginning, middle, or end, so whenever the time comes and we're done, we're gonna be done, and I'll figure that out. Um, there will hopefully have a few minutes for question and answers. Um, if I were to say to you that we are contemporarily faced with a crisis, I don't think anybody would just agree with that, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, and perhaps crisis is inadequate a term. So, I mean, I could say multiple crises. I could say there were crises before the Trump administration. There were crises during the Obama administration. There were crises before the Obama administration. But crisis is inadequate. But if I were to say to you that we have hit a point of saturation, that's a little bit more precise of a term. And I would actually say that something that is both culturally and scientifically a term would be something called hypersaturation. We are now faced with a condition contemporarily that is so immersive, there is so much data, and there are so many things that are at risk, that are at odds, that are at contention, that it is impossible to consume the information and to consider the information with any contemplation at all to garnish the facts, to form an opinion on what you believe, and then to move forward with that in some kind of way that genuinely has a consequence or makes a difference in your life, in the, your community's lives, in your family's lives, in, the, in, in, in trying to describe and to, or to interact in a world that you choose to interact with. And I would probably preface this by suggesting that I, I, I was in Berlin, as uh, Arnold had mentioned, at the Academy, and before the election, during the election, and after the election, okay? I, I was living there for about eight months in total, um, you could hear a, of those of us that I will call a progressive community, um, those of us, the half of the country that did not vote for Donald Trump, you could hear a gasp in, in Germany. <laughs> the sound was so loud by the half of, of this country who was in utter shock that such a thing happened. But I would remind you in the, in the midst of that shock that we are still, I would argue that we're still in, the, 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 it hasn't even become trauma yet because we're, we are, it's still an evolving process of what we are being confronted with. But in effect, to be fair, imagine eight years previously, there was half of this country when President Obama was elected gasped in the exact same way. And so what we have to understand is that, that we are faced with a, an, a circumstance of a binary that is not negotiable. We, there is no way to resolve this because it's a, a tug of war, an ideological tug of war that people literally believe differently and people literally want the world to be enacted in their worldview. And until we can rethink this, we are going to have a conflict that is, that, that is going to, we might be at the tipping point. And if, that, and if that's true, then we have to be very cautious because it's, there's a forbearing here that, is, um, that should be taken note of. But nonetheless, um, so I'm, I'm going to just sort of continue here. So anyway, uh, the death of everything almost except love and gravity. So I'm going to begin with love. And I'm, if I get to the end of this, my images, we're going to end with love. I would argue that that is, this, that is the one sustainable idea that matters. It matters above and beyond everything else, in my opinion. And I do not say that lightly because I have spent my life committed to two trajectories completely and, and totally. And one is the 
being living a life as an artist, and the other is in in teaching. I taught for more than half of my life, and I have been dedicated to these two single ideas. But I have to say that without without love, you can't move either of those two things. Um, the crisis of the species in the 21st century. It's something. This is what we are going to talk about tonight. Then. This is just, there's no such thing as a free relax or better call Becky with the good hair. I mean, that should be funny. Maybe it's not funny. Maybe everyone doesn't know who Becky with the good hair is, but Beyonce, the lemonade, infidelity. Anyway, if, if you don't know what that means, you should maybe, I, I guess, look it up. I don't maybe not. But uh, it was Beyonce basically with one song body slamming the politics of race through beauty in looking and making an examination between Becky with the good hair is referring to traditional notions of beauty that have been archetyped versus what other ideas of beauty would be in Beyonce's case being black or having curly hair, right? Becky with the good hair was Jay-Z's um, affair with a white woman, straight hair. I mean, it, it's less the infidelity that's the point. I think it's about actually the commentary of race that is embedded in this particular comment, which is embedded into the song itself. So this is extraordinary. I mean, you can't, you can't make stuff like this up. <laughs> Kellyanne Conaway live on stage, right? She says, we have microwaves that turn into cameras. Now, if that's not an art, if that's not an art idea, nothing is an art idea because that means the microwaves, can you feel them in the room? They are taking our picture right now, right? There are microwaves everywhere, right? I mean, this is just fantastic. And, this is the image that came out with her when she made the statement, and this, what is fascinating about this image, how many contemporary artists in the past 20 years or so can you name that shoot portraiture like this? Half a, I can name a half a dozen off the top of my head. So what the point would be to suggest that if you do not think that we are in a culture war, we are, and that we are at a point in a culture war where the complete appropriation of everything that we had previously invented in any other time is now being used against us in, 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 in complete totality. And I would probably argue in my lifetime, of course, I'm, um, there, this has been going on much longer than I've been alive, but I am in, this is my, will be my third culture war. This is the third one that I can actually talk about having experienced or participated in, and we keep making the same mistake, and we need to rethink this. Um, this is just an image that I happen to love. This is the Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi. And it's just a stunning piece of architecture. Um, that's about it. Maybe we begin here. Um, and I think that perhaps as you read this, perhaps first and foremost, we need to talk about ethics or that we need to identify that ethics, the question of our principles and how we identify those principles, that we actually identify what they are as opposed to making assumptions of what they are. Assumption is the biggest mistake in any context that we can make. So if, if we have ethics and then we have principles and we have an, ide an ideology or a means by which we live our life, it is not so much what we say, but it's how we behave. It is our actions that speak to who and what we are politically. And we have to have the conversation about ethics in order to understand the contemporary circumstance that we were living in by which to mount any kind of counter-offensive, whatever that means, right? I think there has to be a third way out of this, but I believe we begin here, we begin with Butler, and I think it's quite important. This, since we seem to cycle around and around over and over again, and like I said, we have been here before, one of the most important moments would be this, would be the debate and fierce debate that happened between <clears throat> Bataille and Breton and what they were talking about was fascism. And they were trying to think through what fascism were. And they had a, a diametrically opposed views on how to deal with it. But what they did agree on was the idea, which is here, is a counteraction. So in other words, what has not been identified contemporarily about how we ended up in the situation that we are in, and I'm going to make an argument for this as I go, I think the error that has been made is that Traditional politics in the United States, conventional politics in the United States, the same as in war, when you are faced with um, guerrilla warfare, essentially, conventional warfare always loses. So if you have guerrilla politics 
facing conventional politics and conventional politics will lose. No one in this country, again, on the, uh, half of this country, believed that anyone like Donald Trump could ever be elected. Why didn't they believe he could be elected? Because they didn't think hard enough about the fact that he literally tossed out the rule book in every way, every shape, every form, no matter what it was. He did everything that would have sunk every other politician in any other time. How was he able to get away with that? Because he simply didn't play by anybody's rules. He made up rules as he went along. So when, what do you want to talk about? You want to talk about the British fighting the IRA in Northern Ireland. They could not defeat them. A thousand guys hiding behind trees, right? How about Vietnam War? Conventional warfare against guerrilla force didn't work. How about even the founding of this country? How did the British get beat? The British were beaten because you had guerrilla warfare. They were not standing in lines with white X's on top of red uniforms, right? These are just symbolic, but the, sim the symbology is important. If we have been at a point, I do not believe what we are facing is fascism, because if we're facing fascism, then you have to realize it took a world war to defeat this the first time. So we, if we characterize like that, that I, we already are putting ourselves at odds <clears throat> without ha having an ability to understand it. This is written by, um, and I'm going to read this for you as you read it, but this is written by um, Alexander Hamilton in 1792. The truth unquestionably is that the only path to a subversion of the Republican system of the country is by flattering the prejudices of the people and exciting their jealousies and apprehensions, to throw affairs into confusion and bring on civil commotion. When a man unprincipled in life, desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, possessed of considerable talents, despotic in his ordinary demeanor, known to have scoffed in private the principles of liberty, when such a man is seen to mount a hobby horse of popularity, to join the cry of danger to liberty, to take every opportunity of embarrassing the general government and bring it in under suspicion, to flatter and to fall with all the nonsense of all the zealots of the day, it may be justly suspected that he has, his object is to throw things into confusion that he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind. This is written by Alexander Hamilton in 1792. If that is not a prediction of the current crisis we face, nothing is. While I think there are plenty of holes in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as a document to live by, this is certainly undeniable in its foresight as to what the Constitution should be doing, which is to prevent the situation that we are contemporarily in. This is a, just a fantastic painting in terms of the death of Caesar. So for a, minute, for a minute, if we think like Trump, Trump uses brilliantly misdirection and distraction. So there's a story about Houdini, one of my favorite is, he had an auditorium like this, filled, of course, because he's Houdini, and there was an elephant in the middle of the room. With everybody watching, him standing there, pff, he made the elephant disappear. No one could figure out how he did it. No one, everyone in the room just like, why? Wow, like, it just disappeared. As the story goes, he, the, he didn't do any, he, he used misdirection and he distracted people and he moved an elephant out of the room while they were watching. It's kind of fantastic. I'm not sure if the story is true or not, but the story is the point, right? So this is a, I, I have spent a lot of time, too, I spent a lot of time in Paris also and this was, came out right away when during the election, we kind of embodied a kind of French <laughs> attitude of what was going on. This was in Berlin, and Der Spiegel was making these fantastic covers, um, which is interesting because it's a, this was a European response to the condition in this country. My experience of this is very different, perhaps, than, than being here, because I was really on the outside, and being in Berlin and Paris both, but predominantly in Berlin, it, it, it gave it a little bit more room for some ways of thinking about this. This is the second cover that came out with Der Spiegel. America first, right? Time, the recent time, Trump himself. This is the, just, um, this is one example of, if you, if you imagine that for one moment that he's not stupid, just for one moment, just, I know that that goes a counter to everything that you, we hear, it's every, counter to almost all analysis that has gone on, but it's almost impossible for, for his position to have, have to rise in the manner that he did without intelligence. So this is a, th imagine if this is just a script. Imagine that he's an actor 
and a theater of politics. That's what this is. It's a, it's a theater of politics. So then this kind of language, the construction of this kind of language and the way that he does it, the way that he did something that people had dreamed to turn social media into a, this kind of tool and nobody had done it except for Trump. Trump circumvented all media. He literally controls the media by doing this and now you can't look at anything without him being on the cover of it. He, an article about, I mean, he took all of the air out of the room in this country and it's always about him and it's always about what he's doing with nothing substantive following. It's simply, it's, 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 it's just a distraction, right? This is one of my favorite is that he suggested that um, this was Obama and then this is Trump. They said that they photoshopped all the people <laughs> from his inauguration over to the Obama photo. That's why there were so many people in the Obama photo, right? I mean, that's just like, okay, really? <laughs> so this is what we think Trump is. This is what Trump would do, gonna do to the White House, right? This is the Oval Office, okay? This is the Lincoln bedroom. This is the Rose Garden. This is Situation Room. But in fact, that's the stupid Trump that every, I think that he would like us to believe. But in fact, you have to look a little bit deeper and you have to realize who Trump is. Trump is this. Trump is the Bannon wing, right? Trump is the Pence wing. Trump is the McCain wing. Trump is the friends and family wing. Trump is the party wing. Look at the organization of this. Okay, mind you, I, 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 I have put this together for you, but it's, this is taken from data and information that I found. This, this is, this is real-time data in terms of understanding the system and the structure that he has put in place around him, right? The Wall Street ring. This is completely military in his organization. The bureaucrats, right? 1.8 million federal workers, right? Other important figures. Look at the organization. So what does it remind me of? It reminds me of the Borg, actually. And the Borg wanting to assimilate everything that they touch to becoming one being, right? There's no... There is no dissidence. There is no, there is no um, debate here amongst the board. This is a game. You can take a dump on Donald Trump. That was funny. Or this is always an option, right? People forget the long-held tradition in this country of this kind of activity, right? So what happens if we think about this country? What if you think about pro the project of America? Is it possible that it's not, that it was never sustainable. I mean, that's just a simple question in the sense that the premise of this country was founded on essentially three different premises. One was institutionalized slavery, period. Just institutionalized slavery. You had, second, the complete genocide of Native Americans in this country. Third, which was a little bit later, but the annexation from Mexico, a war was started by President Polk in order to Annex the Southwest, which was incredibly rich, so from Texas to California. Um, can you recover from that as the origins of your country? As, if that is the founding principle that we stand on, then it's, it is no wonder that we have, no, we have no, we cannot agree on any of these three things, civil rights, social justice, or human rights. There is no, there is no tenable discussion that can be had. It is, it is always seen as a battleground. It is always seen as something that is non-resolvable because perhaps the, the basic premise is flawed from the very beginning. It's just, a, it's just a question. Or we have what is the response, the public response, which has been extraordinary and needs to continue this kind of protesting. And I would suggest that there is a, a, a sense of rioting that is embedded in that. Um, it's a visible face of people who disagree, right? Because it's because what else can be done right now? What the question, so that's the question, what can be done now, right? So that's another Borgian that's the opposite. Resistance is futile except when it isn't. But the tenth man is an idea that I would suggest that we could think about. The tenth man is an is a is an Israeli concept, the, the Mossad, which is basically like this the American version of the CIA. Um, uh, if there are nine people in a room debating any topic, it makes no difference what the topic is, and nine people in the room come to consensus about what a course of action should be, it is then the responsibility of the 10th person in the room 
to com take the complete opposite view, to reject the opinion of the other nine in the room, and then to act on the tenth person's view. This is a, this is a, this is a very sophisticated, both military and political structure by which to use because it's, had we done that when everyone believed that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected, we might not have elected Donald Trump. Something else might have had happened. That's, just, that's a large supposition, but nonetheless, this, this idea of the 10th man or 10th person in the room to object and to act on the objection is, is, is a, a substantive idea. This is, um, look at the, the longest form of resistance Sustainable protest and resistance in the United States has been by black Americans um, since slavery in the United States. It has sustained itself over the entire length and breadth of this country up to today. This is Black Mask was a radical black anarchist group in New York. In this happens to be from 1969. They, one of the very first places that they chose to protest was the, the Met. And why did they protest at the Met is because the Met, they understood that the battle was not, the, the political battle was a cultural battle, and that the cultural battle has to do with the, the canonization of ideas, the canonical ideas that get represented in our history. So they proposed burning down the Met, which is just a fantastic idea. I mean, what if, you, what if that the action is that extreme? What if you take away the institutionalized, the, the institutionalized history and you, you, you act upon something else other than what you inherit. What if, what if we have something other than our inheritance, both politically, socially, and intellectually? Nonetheless, they're quite radical group, which then Black Lives Matter contemporarily is, their, is the current manifestation of this. Of course, Black Lives Matter is was heavily influenced, I would argue, by the second culture war, which is the culture war of the late 80s, and early 90s, which was predominantly a war that was one about censorship. It was a war about, against um, gay and lesbian people. It was a war against homophobia. It was, a, it was a war that ACT UP in New York took extremely seriously and was extremely effective politically in how they organized themselves to become, to, to take action in ways that were substantive. Right? And before them, it would be the actions of the 60s and 70s, which would be the anti-war movement, it would be the free speech movement, that were the pre predecessors to that, and the predecessors to that would be obviously the civil rights movement. And we can keep going backwards with this, right? That one form of res social resistance and political resistance and cultural resistance informs the next generation of that, and the next generation is informed again, and compounded together, it's, su it's something, a historical precedent that is substantive, and that what we need to learn from in order to, to to find the correct course of action. This, the, everyone, I mean, had anyone paid attention to this, this was never going to be stopped. When they, when they said the protesting was done and that this was gonna, that when President Obama was still in office and this was gonna be stopped, it, it, was impo it was never going to be stopped. Anyone that believed it was gonna be stopped does not understand the history that I am talking about. The line on the bottom here is the Dakota Access Pipeline website. And so, and this is just fantastic. It is the safest and most, environmentally sensitive way to transport crude oil from domestic wells to American consumers. That's just a fan, that's like a tagline you, you, you know, you can't write. It's just so fantastic. Some German hallucinations. I, I tend to, um, in my life, I tend to, to drift. I just, I just drift. I prefer to not um, stay in this reality very long. So if I'm drifting and hallucinating, it's kind of normal for me. Um, Berlin allowed for me to even hallucinate even further. I'm not talking about drug-induced hallucinations. I'm just talking, I can do it on my own <laughs> without any aid of any extra substances. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm just, anyway, I'm in Germany, and I was trying to train, and I saw that, you know, and it's like, really? In the middle of the German countryside? Or this is, Karl Marx Alley is where, during the, when the East and West were divided, and Karl Marx Alley is where the, um, the, um, the Russia uh, would march the same, same way that China and North Korea would have their parades, which were fantastic. Karl, this was the, 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 the seat of communism. And you think that Marx 
would ever imagine that he would just become a bistro, right, down on the side of the road, really? You know, it's like, but that's just like unbelievable, right? I mean, and, and this is Vansi. This is where the American Academy is, which Vansi, this is, um, it's a large, it's a series of lakes that are actually rivers, but they look like lakes. And across the way from the American Academy is the uh, Vansi Conference Center, which is where the final solution was determined. Literally, the building, the place where Hitler and all of the upper echelon of his uh, administration met. And this it's turned into a museum, of course, and it's, held in, it's kept intact. Architecturally, it's quite extraordinary to visit, but it's the weight. It, I mean, you can cut the air with a knife. The, the weight is so, it's palpable, right? The, 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 they were casually looking at the lake, sitting at the lake, having this discussion about the final solution. This is my 1967 Dimitri East German made bicycle that I got around on. And this is my, this is my mode of, you can, <clears throat> the best mode of transportation ever. And uh, you never see me ride a bike in LA, but <clears throat> in Berlin, you never saw me not on a bike. And so, um, and these are just sort of foot, I, I, images like this are kind of like drawings or notes for me. They're just things that you see. This is Lady Gaga, right? I mean. The House of presents Lady Gaga. The House of, that was just too good. You know, China Box, just beat up stuff. This was um, someone's wedding just in the middle of the street. Just kind of fantastic. <clears throat> That's, I doubled that slide, sorry. This is a, I always love this begin with Apple when you take historic images and then just slap a logo on it, right? Is it possible they were just computer code, right, in the matrix, right? Is it possible that that's true, that, that, that our existence here is actually not our real existence, that it's not, we don't actually live lives, but we're just in pods? <clears throat> I'm going to turn a slightly different direction for you, which is that I've come, in the next few years, there's a number of, I, I, I have in my life over, a very long period of time, I pivot quite often. And what I mean by pivot, I say moving down one trajectory and I will turn on a dime to move another direction because I privilege experimentation over everything else. I privilege um, theory and philosophy. Uh, I, it, it, there, there are questions, as Arnold suggested, that I cannot answer, but I am, will continue to unpack and to mine not to get an answer, but in order to have a, a more a deeper understanding and that changes. It changes from when I was 20 and 30 and 40 and 50, right? I mean, it, this, lots of the world has changed, and yet it has stayed the same. But how do we arm ourselves with the tools necessary in order to no negotiate this? And it, I, for this, it remind, I needed to sort of reflect a little bit on the sort of uniqueness of my, um, in this case, education, and perhaps some of them, what we would call, what Freud would call a primal scene, right, the, the, the moment where things begin. And I have a number of those to share with you. Before anyone thinks in their mind, why is, it prime, why is it the many fathers as opposed to the many mothers, maybe I could remind you that in the, my education in the 70s, for example, when I went to CalArts, um, here, oh, nope, it's not yet, sorry. Um, when I went to CalArts in the, in the 70s, there were five minorities in the entire school, five. I can name you all of them, actually. There was a black kid in design program. There was a uh, named Nolan Curtis. There was a woman named Shirley Yee who was uh, doing product design. There was a guy named George Torres who was studying classical guitar. There was a, a photographer named Pak Chi Lao who was in the photo department. And then there was me in the art department, five people. So the, the tension between who one was unidentified, set in a context where the fathers of West Coast conceptualism founded themselves. And at this point in time, when I arrived there, they had already, these, and essentially these men had already gotten rid of feminism. What had begun as a feminist project had already been disbanded. And so you had, there were almost no female teachers at the time. They were all men teaching. They were all white men teaching. Right? And 
So, but nonetheless, out of that, you, have, you find something. But let me, I'll begin even further. But <clears throat> I am not, I do not believe in institutionalized religion. I am not religious myself in the sense of, in that qualification. But have perhaps my background and my parents that I was in and out of public school for most of my, of the, of like, for a very large period of time because I kept getting, having difficulties um, in one manner or another, and eventually they sent me to the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are a contradiction because they are both the intellectuals of the Catholic Church, but they are also the, and, and revolutionaries by definition, but they are also the, the architects of the Inquisition, for example. <laughs> so somehow they, they negotiate these two things, and that contradiction fundamentally is I find in myself, right? I, and it starts, it begins here, right? And it begins, it also begins with these two gentlemen because I became of age when this kind of radical politics was out in the open, right? This kind of political movement was something that one didn't hear about, was something that one, either you participated in or you were there and things that were taking place in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state, in this country. Right. The next maybe is Mishima that I had begun. Someone once gave me one book, and then I just I then all of a sudden became more Japanese than I became anything else. Actually, um, Mishima had an extraordinary influence on me. This is 1975 at CalArts. These are probably the four people whom I would say were foundational in teaching me. And I come out of CalArts during the Asher period. I am the second group of students that, um, where the dematerialization of the object manifested itself, a post-studio position manifested, that was the origin of it, that was the, that was the, the epicenter of this kind of thinking. Um, Hubler, Baldessari, and Cummings in photography, because again, these kind of conceptual actions that were taking place. Simultaneously, I caught the tail end the, essentially the Frankfurt School, a lot of German intellectuals and writers moved to Southern California. Marcuse was one of them, and I was able to study with Marcuse. So my Marxism comes directly from that, from studying with him at UC San Diego in his seminars. And I was to do that long enough where it enabled, a found, already at my age, foundationally, understanding a kind of Marxism that, again, was not a Marxism that was of the past, but one that was trying to be enacted contemporarily. This is how I found my voice was uh, Klaus Rinka was in Los Angeles in the early 80s. He lived there for a couple of years and I just, again, sheer serendipity or luck, I ended up getting introduced to him and I ended up being his studio assistant. And I basically said, okay, I will trade you. You teach me voice and I will do whatever you want me to do in the studio. And he fed me voice intravenously. So he was the protege of voice. So everything that he learned from Boyce, I learned is like learning from Boyce directly. So my interest in a Boisean methodology and way of being is updated a la my education at CalArts, but nonetheless, it is influenced, it's, it's heavily influenced by Boyce. And then Derrida, um, he, had, he loved UCI. So beginning somewhere in the early 90s, Derrida would come and teach one quarter one seminar class every spring for at least 15 or so years. And this is what he wrote, one of the last things he wrote at the end of his life. For it must be cried out at a time when some have the audacity to neo-evangelize in the name of an ideal of liberal democracy that has finally realized itself as the ideal of human history, never have violence, inequality, exclusion, famine, and economic oppression affected us and many human beings in the history of the earth and of humanity. Instead of singing the advent of the ideal of liberal democracy and of the capitalist market in the euphoria of the end of history, instead of celebrating the end of ideologies and the end of the great emancipatory discourses, let us never neglect this obvious macroscopic fact made up of innumerable singular sites of suffering no degree of progress allows one to ignore that never before in absolute figures have so many men, women, and children been subjugated, starved, or exterminated on this earth. That is a fact. That is Derrida towards the end of his life, and it's an extraordinary statement. So Derrida says, I am at war 
with myself, which I completely understood. And after talking to him and taking classes with him for 15 years, essentially, I realized not only was I at war with myself, but I was at war with the world. And this, is, this has both been a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? So this is a response that I wrote when I was in Berlin. Once, we once heralded the fall of the Berlin Wall as the augur of the universal triumph of liberalism. After 2008, this event looks increasingly less like the end of history than the mute herald of an impending implosion. But the spectacular attacks in Paris, Nice, New York, Washington, D.C., London, and Madrid, to name a few, the relentless quasi and extrajudicial bombings and drone attacks in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, and Syria, or the collapse of financial markets, never quite succeeded in bringing anything down decisively. Yet, within and alongside these traps of our ethical attention, other event forms, aesthetic and argumentative artifacts, live at the precipice of the figured. In the fog of becoming, in the potential realm where something might happen if and when the conditions for support and endurance emerge, there is nothing inherently good or evil, a rent, just or unjust in the precipice conditions, and yet they may well be more decisive in shaping the continuity of, world, of the world than the spectacles of the 22nd century. 22nd century excuse me. How do we conceptualize, politicize, aestheticize these forms of events in the efforts of social endurance? It's kind of a very long question, but it's a question. Uh, these are just, I, I'm sure these exist, but I'm never sure where I see them. Um, I have a deep love of space, and I, I will explain this in a brief moment, and of NASA. I, NASA, JPL are in LA, and I mean, I've been in love my entire life, actually, and uh, I'm a big fan of the coyote, because this is important. So the, the roadrunner and the, cannot harm the coyote except by going beep, beep. That's all it's got, right? <laughs> okay. This is the piece of the Berlin Wall in a cemetery in Berlin. This is the first flower grown in space, which is just fantastic. Look at that. I mean, is that it's like a painting? Let's look at capitalism for one minute. Joseph Stieglitz spoke on the euro. But look, that just for this, the illegal drugs in the United States create a... I'll move out of your way. Sorry. Um, illegal drugs in the United States create a huge black market. Um, an estimated 600 to 750 billion dollars a year inside in the United States, with the current decade seeing the largest per person drug uses in American history. That's a, that's a business opportunity. That's not a war on drugs, that is a business opportunity to be part of an industry that makes more money than almost any other industry, and it's very difficult to quantify how that business functions, right? How about the art market? I have three favorite market. So one is drugs, the other is art. The art, global art market, $63.8 billion in 2015. $63.8 billion of art has been transacted. I don't know what that means exactly, but I know that that is not a good. <laughs> that just, I mean, just, yeah, I'm not sure how you propose ideas counter to a marketplace or even have the room or air to breathe with that environment. So Modigliani, no, who's going to say that Modigliani is not a great artist? I, very few people. Is it worth $170 million? No, it is not. It's a completely arbitrary, fictitious number like everything else in the stock market. But people buy it. Who makes the most money in the art market? Look at this pie chart. The United States holds 43% of the world sales on art, 21% the, in the UK, 19% in China, and the rest of the world doesn't matter, basically. How about the, this is President Trump's $3.6 billion mark, uh, budget. Half the pie chart, 49% is individual income. 31% is payroll tax. That's us. Income, payroll tax. 54%, $622 billion on the military. On the military. This will give you some idea. So the military means you're giving contracts to people, which is what you're reading right now. But I'm just going to skip to the bottom. $12.9 trillion was spent on the Iraq and Afghanistan war. $12.9 trillion. That's just an extraordinary amount of money that corporations are paying for. This is how much, this is how much money the United States spends in comparison to everyone else in the world. This, to give you some sense of our new wall that's going up, take a look at the, let's see if I can find, is this it? No, no, that's not it. There's a laser pointer on here somewhere. Nope, that's not it. 
sorry, back to my wall. Berlin Wall, 3.6. The uh, Israeli Wall in the West Bank, right, 700 kilometers. Our wall is going to be 1,600 kilometers, right, at $21.6 billion. That means, like, the, like war, this is what you're funding. And I always wonder why we're so worried about the Mexican border, but this is all you have at the Canadian border. <laughs> you have one little obelisk <laughs> that says that's the border. <laughs> that's the international border. And people are like, I'm sure, like, you know, walking by. And like, but no one's worried about Canada. I don't, no one's ever worried about Canada. I don't know why that is. Bitcoin is now valued more than gold. This was a great, uh, this is apparently what conservatives think of the left or us. And I thought, well, maybe that's okay because we're all superheroes in this image, right? They think we're all superheroes or have magical powers. I mean, so that's not so bad because if that's true, then we have David Bowie, right? And if that's true, we have David Bowie again, and then we have RuPaul, which is she's the he, she, she, OG of she, he, right? And then that also gives us Sun Ra, right? I mean, why not? These are all people with supernatural powers just by their very nature. So um, that's just funny. This is the Iranian president visiting the Pope, but apparently you can't have uh, genitals shown on the most famous statues in the world, so they hid them all. And these are the, what t the testicles you can't see. But in LA, we have soft porn everywhere in the billboards with American Apparel, which is very common. And they, um, they're going out of business now, but it's worth taking a look. This is the Ebola virus, which I happen to love the shape of it. This is the frame of the Mona Lisa, which I think is also interesting intellectually. I don't care about the Mona Lisa, actually. I care about the frame that the Mona Lisa is in. Um, this is the actual iceberg that sank the Titanic. The actual one, not like a separate one. This is the one with the longitude and latitude on this. I'm not sure why um, white supremacists like Skittles. I mean, I know why they like Skittles, but this sort of tells you something. This image says it all by Donald Trump Jr. Let's end political correct agenda that doesn't put America first. I mean, that's just so bizarre, okay? So this is uh, Julie Carson's a theorist that I uh, work with quite a lot. This is about Giorgiano Bruno, who was a heretic because they like um, Galileo su suggested that we didn't, that the earth revolved around the sun and he was burnt at the stake for thinking like this. So the, I hear... What I'm interested in is the idea of a radical act. This is the very first machine that landed on the moon to take pictures. And this is a picture, um, it transmitted 11,000 basically still photographs. What would then was just compared to what we have now is like ancient primitive technology. This is a picture of, that one of the astronauts took of the surveyor itself. But this is the picture that the surveyor took of itself. It's its own self-portrait. The reason this is significant and the reason this is now will direct us towards everything else is that my father worked on the optical system designing the cameras that took the pictures on the moon. And this is the picture that I saw on my wall of my home from when I was a very little boy. I was nine years old when this image appeared. And my dad was obsessed with making images on the moon that were rendered in such a manner that would give us some idea before we got there what it meant to be on the moon. And this perhaps is per what, this is, this is an index, a self-portrait of a shadow that is only composed of the surface of the moon and the light of the sun. So it's through its own negation as an image that it represents itself and quantifies itself as actually existing. And it only in recent years that I realized that this image was the foundation of my entire life's work, which was simply why that I avoided with like, a, like the plague, I refused to identify my ethnicity or identity on the front end of who I am. I have cate almost categorically rejected this notion um, because I wanted to be recognized for what I did, not who I was. Now that might seem at odds given the texture and tenure of who and what we are, but I'm not sure that that's the case. Anyway, um, this is, Doug Hubler said that he wanted to photograph every living person that existed on the planet and that he no longer wanted to make objects to contribute to the world. And Hubler and I had a running fight the entire time. And there are very few pictures of Hubler, but I asked him to pose for me 
and this for a series of photographs, and this is the, oh, this is the work. It's first the index. This is completely, I'm sure, foreign to most people. This is a great card and a color chart, grayscale, right? But this is in several actions. This is the cup, the dean's cup, his posturing, and this is Doug Hubler's. This is what I call Doug Hubler's Cadillac, and it's misspelled with the Cadillac going vertical. Um, this I'm going to just. Take you back here for a second. So, right here. So, this work, I was 19 years old when I made this. That's how long I have been thinking about this. And I show this to you because it's not because I'm gonna, it's a history of work, it's simply that I've been thinking back about this, 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 this primal moment and what it means. Anyway, so, he does not remember, he does not remember Anything of what he has forgotten, but acts it out. He reproduces it, not as a memory, but as an action. He repeats it without, of, of course, knowing that he is repeating it. That is Freud, and that is what we do. We repeat without knowing it, right? Racism in America. This image I'm showing you of Michael Brown being shot, is, I show it to you because it's unique in the sense that we, his body lied in the street for an inordinate amount of time, and then the body was covered. It was almost as if they created a spectacle of the shooting and the body in a way that we had not seen previously, right? And the index of this is slippery because the spectacle and the watching of this image is something that we have become accustomed to. And we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean that we become accustomed to these images? So I think the, co the discussion, of the, con the conversation of race in the United States is almost impossible. Um, we can't have it because we've forced it into a binary about being black and white. And it, there is no subtlety. There is no way of grappling with this sort of the, the, the crudeness of which people, of what people face on a daily basis. But for example, brown bodies and, um, the, I mean, just the, the conversation needs to be much more multidimensional, but it is trapped in a kind of a cyclical space. Anyway. Arnold mentioned this, the, the Whitney Biennial. This was the first proposal. Here's a trick. So you, you, Charlie Ray's fire truck was going to be out front here, which I knew. If, this is Diogenes, which was a Greek philosopher at the time of Plato, who founded the cynic movement, not cynicism, but the cynic movement. And so I realized if you propose something so outrageous that then when you give them a real proposal, that they don't notice it. <laughs> That's the only reason that this ever got it made into existence, in my opinion. But this was a simple transposition of the original type onto this next phrase. And it was a performative action. This is a transaction of entries. You get a tag for paying your money to the museum. And it's a, it was an operatic performance where the people in the museum become the piece. And the piece is fragmented, a la Sassur, which is one of the originators of a linguistic theory. Fragmentation of text, fragmentation of language and movement of language. So when you see I can't, or imagine ever wanting every body, every part of a phrase read something different. To be white, right? This one, imagine gay boys make me hard, right? What does that mean? And when you see it like this. So the only story I have that's useful here is that, in the sense is that um, David Ross, who was the director of the museum then, one point came up and said, oh, Daniel, do you want to meet Yoko Ono? I said, yeah, I want to meet Yoko Ono. And so he says, you know, we introduced it. I said, I, like, I have a present for you. And I, and I had in my pocket a handful of tags, and so I gave her Imagine, right? And so that, that should have make, that should be, you should understand that's quite sweet. John Lennon, Imagine, wow, okay, you guys are tough, <laughs> okay? Okay, so the, the guards cannot wear jewelry or embellishments on their uniforms, and a guard came to me one day and said, hey, you know, we want to wear the tags, but they won't let us. So I spoke to David, and I said, the curators, I said, well, truth in fact is the tags are not decoration or, or jewelry. They, why can't they wear them? And they said they agreed, and so the, Guards went wild, and they started making their own compositions, which were quite fantastic. This is the discarding of the tags. It appears here. It appears here again. It, Arthur Danton writing the most... It, originally, Danto, who I knew, actually because of Mary Jane here in the early 90s, um, probably wrote the most scathing attack on the work. And... After that, over the years, I got to know Danto quite well on a number of occasions where we um, communicated and we had, you know, we talked. And 10 or 15 years later, 
This is, Arthur Dante was a philosopher. He happened to write about art, but he was a philosopher first. In the end, he did something that is, I've never seen done actually. He completely recanted his position and wrote a new piece about, particularly about the biennial, but in particular about the tags, where he saw it completely differently. But it took him like 10 or more years to see that. And it's something worth noting. This is one of my favorite. During the biennial, someone decided to make these and sell them. There was ads in art form. And um, so one day I called up this number to buy this. I said, hey, do you have any more of those Daniel Martinez buttons left? And they said, oh, yeah, but we're going fast. I said, I want 100. But I said, when you send me my 100, would you please send me 50% of all the money that you've made on selling these tags? And they said, why would we do that? I said, well, my name's Daniel Martinez. Bam, they hung up the phone. That was it. That was the end of that. And then recently, this will be part of our discussion tomorrow, if any of you choose to come, that was repurposed once again to talk about the current um, Dana Schultz, the situation painting at the Whitney. Um, and there's lots, well, I won't go on that. That's a lot to say about that. This I found two days ago. This is, it says, you may be picking cotton, but we're picking you to go to the prom with us. And this guy down here, John Aro, it's 2000 and fucking 17. <laughs> I mean, really? So this is, this is to give you some idea of the condition of, this, of what we live in culturally and socially. Who could say that? I mean, he's right. It's fucking 2017. How is that possible that that exists, right? Or how does this exist? I mean, really? Probably one of the most famed, legendary pieces of writing, Ghost in the Shell. I mean, it's epic. This, I mean, this is a huge debate in itself. I mean, these are all debates that, are, that are, we are not going to solve here, but it's something that we're thinking about. What happens when real life and art move so slippery between each other that they become, hence, that, that art is diminished in the presence of real life, and real life is only a replica of that of art, right? I mean, this is a, 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 an algorithm that needs to be thought about. This is, this is ironically, I mean that, this is, a, this is this shooting that takes place that is recorded step by step in a gallery of photography, right? That's not a, a, a sculpture on the ground. That is actually a dead man, and that's the shooter. But watch this. This is, might as well be performance. Where does the camera go, right? And this is the, this, I, this I took a lot. I found this just as the, 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 after they had shot the person that did the original shooting. I mean, this... When I get to some of these images, you're gonna, you'll understand. Um, these are a set of images that were for the 93 Venice Biennial. They are images of the Red Brigade when they were being arrested. This is the NSA, and I, 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 didn't, I just sourced this off the internet. Some, one of the gentlemen in the back told me that they thought that, um, I can't remember who they said they thought this was from. Um, Anyway, this is the NSA. It's a fantastic image. This is wedding photographs. A photographer is doing wedding image is in, Sy in Aleppo, in Syria, against the backdrop of total and absolute epic destruction that has been taking place there. This, I'm not going to read this up, but this is, this is a, a piece on the side of a building in LA, but it's a list of every single intelligence agency in the United States. It's extraordinary kind of, if, when you read this off, it's just kind of a marriage. These are these funny little drawings I do in my neighborhood, and then I just leave them um, on fences. That's it. I just, they don't, they have, there's just like little gestures. I live in South LA. This is the attack on Paris. This is, so this photographically, this, this is based on Nietzsche's um, How to Philosophize the Hammer or Twilight of the Idols. The gist of this is simply this, is that Nietzsche proposed that if for us to move forward as a species, in order to evolve as a species, all idols that are worshipped must be killed, must be destroyed. He meant he's beginning with religion, beginning with money, beginning with acquisition of wealth and property, everything. But he said the very first thing that needs to be killed is the ego of the self. And so these are a series of performative works using people in Hollywood for special effects. There's no Photoshop in any of these images you're about to see. They're all recreations based on paintings, based on films, based on pieces of literature, and they enact out the complete destruction of my own body. 
These are all done by hand, complete analog. So this, what this is, is that the proposition here is, what if you create something that is, is complete artifice, but presents itself as complete reality simultaneously? Artifice presented as reality. That means inversely, reality can be presented as artifice. That equation is an equation that we have not yet fully mined as artists, as authors. Because the, in that, the proposition is, it, the well is so deep in terms of the application, both intellectually, philosophically, in terms of our imagination, to tackle any subject that one would want to tackle in any way that one would want to tackle it. It is almost a perfect algorithm, right? If anyone knows, I mean, this is Caravaggio, the Salome, going backwards, of course. <laughs> well, not of course, but perfect reproduction, right? So this first set of images is reflective of my own, my own self-flagellation, you might say, from coming from um, the early idea of the, you know, thinking about the Jesuits early on. This particular image is, a is a, an exact copy of Eddie Adams taking a picture. There were three or four photographs during the Vietnam War that changed the entire consciousness of the United States, literally changed people's view. One was a little girl running down a road that was being napalm. Another was a monk that set himself on fire. This was uh, execution of a Viet Cong man, that picture taken by Eddie Adams, and there were uh, 10 or 12 other photographers there at the exact same moment. Eddie Adams is the only person that took the photograph. So the question of whether one is journalistic and takes the photograph or one intervenes, he apparently took the photograph. He took a lot of heat for that as the years. This is a combination of that photograph combined with Dr. Harold Edgerton, who invented strobe photography. This is one single photo. It took me one year to make this photograph. Everything, there's no Photoshop in this image. This image is the combination of rebuilding the machines that Dr. Edgerton used to create strobe light. It, you know that the picture of the bullet through the apple, the drop of milk that goes like, shows the crown. I mean, all these are very famous, iconic photographs. I copied his principles contemporarily, utilizing contemporary syncing and Hollywood effects to produce this, but to produce it so that it's completely effective, that's me on the side of, well, not of course, because you can't see my arms, but again, that's still the act, in order to interrogate violence, one has to, in this case, become violence. Okay, so I'm gonna move faster. <laughs> The second iteration of this is that I traveled across the United States teaching classes, art classes, in trade to get access to young people under the age of 18 who are in what are called lockdown units because they have committed some crime that they cannot yet be tried for because of their age. They're all over the United States, these lockdown units. And um, here I I'm focusing on the young girls, but the, they allowed me, they normally wear uniforms, so in trade I got to take their picture I got to put them in street clothes, and I got to be able to interact with them outside of the classes, and so just to talk to them. So these are girls that are 14, 15, 16 years old. And you have to imagine what is it they could have done that put them into this situation. It's just, it just, I mean, you just, it's just a question. What can it be? So this, is, this, this aspect of more human than human is a reflection of myself. It is not me, but it is, it is certainly something that I recognize. It's mirrored around me, right? These girls are just fantastic. Oops. The third version of this is I was traveling around the world at the time, being able, I was showing a lot in a lot of different countries, and so this is my own representation of myself, but via a mediated version. So I'm wearing a mediation of myself at places where crises have occurred. Like that this is the first Jewish ghetto in Italy, for example, which is a very small place. So these are constantly, these are interventions into these sites. The history of you are now entering free dairy, of course, for those of you I'm sure might know this, but it started with you are entering free Berkeley. And then it migrated across to, this is being in Northern Ireland, in the city of Derry, where one of the greatest battles between the British and the Northern, and the, uh, uh, the Catholics occurred, um, this site was then marked, you are now entering Free Dairy, then it migrated back 
to the Americas when the war in 1992 started in, in Mexico with uh, Subcommandant Andrew Marcos, the first sign that he put onto the wall onto the ground was you're entering free Chiapas, right? So this, is, this, this idea of entering a free space continues to migrate. I'm gonna go, but this is, this is so good. The, breaking the internet, right? Break the internet, this pose, paper magazine, and then the Met does this. Here at the Met, we have artworks that can break the internet too. And then when you know the, the Met has a sense of humor, because <laughs> that's funny, <laughs> okay? I mean, the Met tweets us out, really? That's like, <laughs> okay, the, I'm gonna, this, this is about NATO, and this is the longest accumulation of titles. There's 28 NATO countries. This is every zombie movie title put into one narrative text. And it goes, stretches itself across 28 different countries as, as I'm posing as different forms of zombieism. The last man on earth, force of the dead, dear city of rotten eaters, alive corpses, dead, warm bodies, slither, vault of horror, mausoleum, plague, ghosts of Mars, live shadows, rabid rise, aliens, my favorite. I traveled in Alaska for a long time, um, lived there for quite a while actually, following the uh, um, Alaskan pipeline, which was a dumb, in retrospect, not a smart thing to do um, by myself. Um, I, there's bears? Who thinks there's bears anywhere, right? Bears in Alaska? Like, you're kidding, right? I'm from LA. <laughs> I lived in New York. I, uh, bears, really? I, anyway, the, Timothy Treadwell, it's a very famous um, uh, Herzog film. He got eaten by bears. But anyway, it seems that there are bears in Alaska because I had my own problem. And this is the result of a certain interaction. I survived, though. Um, the West Bank, this is the West Bank is missing, I am not dead. This is based on Isil Weissman's The Civil Occupation, which is where he did cartography of every single West Bank settlement, which was against Israeli law. And he published them, and I contacted him. He gave me access to these cartography that I made. Basically, these are settlement machines that if they, if you, they, they roll down, they would, they would both build and destroy. And the, what's interesting about this is that in the 1940s, planned housing in the United States, there was an experiment that took place in three cities, Irvine, Houston, and Washington, D.C., in the 1940s of making what we now know as track housing or gated communities. The, the plans for these were perfectly appropriated by the Israelis because they, you can easily turn a gated community into a military comp militarily protected complex. There's one road in, one road out. So it's quite fantastic the way this has been militarized, which has now become common form of architecture over in the world. Am I out of time yet? Or I can... Okay, great. So anyway, this is, this is vacuum form of the actual settlements there. This is the view outside, this is in New York. This, this little piece, of, happened to be at the same time was on the, what came out in the New York Times and um, somebody ripped it off the wall. Apparently they didn't appreciate this aesthetic. Um, I've been working on animatronics. This, so this is the opening of the Cairo Biennial and this is, I've been using animatronics for years and making copies of myself. This is both based on uh, Moby Dick um, and Herman Melville's Moby Dick and um, the figure Ishmael, which figures prominently in all three institutionalized religions. And here, the body is, my body is basically having an epileptic seizure in the middle of the room. And in Cairo, I don't think anyone had ever seen anything like this. this I mean, this is, you know, this is, comes from my experience of living with Disneyland and having grown up in Disneyland and seeing that my whole life and the idea of anime. I mean, this is put together with scotch tape and glue, but nonetheless, it's very effective in proposing that there's a body, someone, they thought it was a live performance, and it was not. It's a machine that acts out the performance. But it continues to, to basically throw itself so hard against the ground that it eventually destroys itself. This was going to be a series of machines. This is a painting by Goya, the Inquisition. These are sketches for what it was. I was going to bake the same installation of the person being accused with his head down, standing up, and then vomiting until the vomit piled so high that it would be a wall of protection for the inquisitor. 
This is, um, they had a show at the Jewish Museum and I, these small refugee blankets, they're made out of mylar, they're quite fantastic. Um, they were, it was, a, it was a, f a giveaway show. Everyone made in the show made giveaways and I made these gold blankets because they're quite fantastic. This is me wearing one. This is one as a painting. These are the Russians and in inflatables. I'm gonna probably end with this. When they, they put up inflatable air forces and inflatable weapons so that when they're seen from the air by satellite, they look like real thing. So look, fighter jet, which is fantastic. So then you go, this is Paul McCarthy in Paris. Okay, so he puts up this giant butt plug and the Parisians of all people in the world were offended by this. <laughs> and they took it down, okay? And then they had a protest when they took it down of a bunch of artists in Paris saying, well, where's the butt plug, the green butt plug, which looks like a Christmas tree, a la Paul McCarthy. And Orlan staged the protest, there it is. And then you could still buy the chocolate version for 100 euros, right? So you could eat your chocolate butt plug, <laughs> right, for 100 euros. And um, it, it just, there's some crazy irony. I mean, the really, uh, French are not usually known for being prudish, right? Not, certainly butt plugs are not new. Um, maybe this will be, wrap it up here. This is a series of, perf all these are, perf all the photographs are performative. They all are durational. They all require extensive um, sculpture, um, applications, prosthetics, um, augmentation of the body, representation of the body, manipulation of the body, and these are four works that have, uh, they're all, uh, as you can start to see uh, developmentally, all the work is autobiographical in some form or fashion, even if it uses an analysis or a critique, institutional critique or a critique of power relations, which is one of the many subject areas that it focuses itself on, but here, once again, these are the onto my body are the, um, the first lines in the three most holiest books. And they basically say the same thing about God to the letter, to the word, whether it is the Old Testament, whether it's the New Testament, whether it's the Quran, it makes no difference. They say the same thing about God. They're talking about the same God, right? This is on an Afghan prayer rug which were, at, at the time, there was a way that the Afghans would tell a story about the war with the Russians. And I think, I happened to, this is, Gaddafi was just fantastic. He always loved gold and gold guns. And then this is the, um, <laughs> this is uh, Mauricio Catalan's gold toilet at the Guggenheim. And then maybe we'll, am I still okay? Okay, let me just see where I can end. I'm gonna end here with this one last image. So this is uh, at the Whitney Biennial. This is based on a text of Walter Benjamin called Divine Violence. It's said to be the most opaque and difficult text that he had written, but basically it suggests, it asks a question, when is violence acceptable? And the question is, was it under God's law or the God law of man? Which is again, the question is curious because of the forced binary, but for two years, what I did on the internet is I created an archive of every organization on the internet that said that it used violence as a means by which to uh, promote its ideology. Left, right, or center, it made no difference, and they were compressed into this room, making these surf finished fetish gold paintings, 26 layers of lacquer paint to make the surface, which are like perfect, finished fetish with this hand painted text. So some of the names of the organization are just fantastic. So whoever these people are, world punishment organization, they're upset with everybody, right? Or free land, right? Um, the multitude, I mean, Hart and Negri wrote a book on this, okay? Um, the nuclei for promoting total catastrophe. I mean, these, I mean they, they should get points for their names alone. The Afrikaner resistance movement. Uh, Martyrs for Morocco, rejection of sins and exodus, right? the Jewish Defense League. So here's what the problem, or what the operation of the work is, is that when you would have something like this next to something like this, people would be in the installation and they would start 
saying, well, you can't, that is a terrorist organization and these people, are, so these are the good guys and these are the bad guys, right? And therein lies the revealing of their own privileging of one political apparatus over another. Here, the, they are presented as completely neutral. The only time they were contentious or found themselves in contrast when people would s start to object to, to the placement of one next to another. And this in lies the question about divine violence. Who promotes violence, who is violent, right? Anyway, so th this was a good one. Jawaweed, a man without a gun on a horse, or this one, sane thinker school as a group in Japan. Anyway, I think we should end there. So anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. I'm happy to answer a question if you have a question. If you don't have a question, we can not have questions. Doesn't matter. What's that? Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> that, and that's the point. I'm looking at this work. I wanted to keep thinking about your work in terms of um, re uh, reality presenting itself as artifice, right? And I know that in a lot of, I knew you fluctuate between those two. The first time I saw that epileptic fit of Ishmael, I was just horrified in that room by myself. Right. And, um, and that's in a sense a kind of, artifice representing itself as reality on a very real level and and felt really and then this piece is then the opposite for me it's kind of like um uh, well is, no this is reality representing as as artifice whereas the other one was artifice represented as reality right but it also also the the boundaries of the paradigm right so Perhaps, I mean, I don't, I, the same way I think that we can't have the conversation about vi a race, or the conversation of race is so difficult, I think this is similarly, we have become so uh, um, familiar with, the converse, with violence that we have an inability to discuss violence, and violence perpetrated in, in all the innumerable ways that it has been done. I mean, if you think about our planet for one second, just say if you go back, the first writing first writing appears approximately 4,000 years ago, right? It's a Hindu text. Um, that we can, in 4,000 years of organized civilization, we, I, I, I am at loss to find any moment on this planet where we have not been at war. There's not a moment when we have not tried to subjugate one group of people by another group of people. There is not one moment that violence is the means of negotiation of conflict. There just isn't. And, and, and so if, we have be, if that is hardwired into us as a species, we have to ask a question about that. And the only way that I can interrogate it is to go from this to the, to the direct representation, say the more human than human work, of the, of the, of the kind of self-inflicted violence that occurs there, right? I mean, the, somewhere between the reflection of the body and the violence inflicted upon the body and the violence that's inflicted on us that is sublime, that's textual, that is subtle, that is, that, repre that its representation is so seductive, that it's so, it, 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 it lures you in such a way that you don't even know that it exists. Versus the, 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 the abhorrent kind of way that we have become accustomed to the imagery. And I don't know what that means. I don't know, I don't know what that is, but that it's something that I, I, I can't, turn myself from because I think it's an existential question, a deeply, profoundly existential question about who we are as a species. How are we going to negotiate our way out of this situation that we are in globally? Forget this country for a minute, just globally. What is the tools of negotiation here? I don't want to live in this kind of world continuously. And, 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 and I'm only one, I'm here for one second of this time on this planet. We can't, this cannot continue and the fashion is continuing. What do we do? I don't, I, I, that's a completely rhetorical question. I do not know. I do, I would, opt, I would opt for that I believe, as I suggested in the very beginning, I think that love is an answer, a kind of an answer that I think is inherent to us as a species.
But I would probably argue without question that art and poetry and philosophy, what we are authors of, that we are the last line of defense for this species. We are the last, if we go, this whole thing just falls over the cliff. It just falls into the abyss. There will be no, there is no bungee back, bungeeing back from that. I think there, and that's going to mean something very different to every artist and how they, man I don't matter if people want to manifest their work in abstraction or they want to manifest it in figuration or they want to manifest it in the most opaque conceptualism, whether that's public, whether that's social, pra it doesn't matter what, how the manifestation occurs or what the, the action is, but I just think that we are more necessary today than we have perhaps ever been on this planet. I, I, I truly, I, I, I would argue that intensely, you know, as the, the viewpoint that we offer is unique still. They, we, they, they just that the species doesn't know they need us. I don't know. Somebody had a question? Um, thank you for all of your insights. And you began with um, uh, thoughts about the current regime, Trump and company. And um, I'm one, and of course, it's essential to be speaking truth to power and joining the resistance as, as art workers. But I'm wondering if, if you have a specific project in mind that, uh, that is addressing those issues that uh, might carry the conversation forward. Um, okay, so I can answer that in a couple ways. One, I'm an, I am an artist. I, 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 I'm, so that's what I am, and I tend to be on the theory side of the world, the concept, very conceptual, very theory side of that manifestation, right? But I also know what I'm not. I'm not a politician. I am not in, I'm not a good business, I'm a terrible business person, right? I'm also not an activist. I'm not an activist. I'm not, I, I, I don't do that. I make art that makes questions about the world that we live in. So the answer to your question is I actually think I've been doing that all my life. I think that I've been interrogating this regime and this question because I don't think it's new. I don't think what's happening in this country is new. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the first time we faced this. I think it was completely predictable. In Europe, when Brexit happened, it was like that. It was like, bam, people better pay attention because if that happened in London, London, my friends in London were stunned when that passed, when that happened. When that vote took place, just stunned that that happened. Okay? No one here paid attention to what happened in England. It was as if it didn't even happen. Right, and I and it was I talked to I was talking to people in, in Berlin. I mean, it just I go that it's watch. You just watch the dominoes are going to fall like no one is ever going to. They're going to pretend like it's not coming and it's going to come. I I mean I, if anyone would ask me, not that I would care to ask me, I would have told you during the election that Trump is going to win this thing, no questions asked. And I and again I think we're in a I think we're in a cul-de-sac, a social, political, and economic cul-de-sac. This has happened before. It just never happened. With social media, it's never happened with the, platform, the, 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 the technological platforms. Billions of images are produced every day. Billions of images are transacted every day. The tools of instantaneous transmission of information, is, 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 it, 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 it's, it has completely reshaped. You can't have the controversy at the Whitney that is going on right now about that painting if you did not have social media. You couldn't have Trump if he didn't have social media. Trump would have never survived without social media. We were not prepared to think about it in this way. So, but if you're asking me, I don't deal with anything specifically. I think I deal with the zeitgeist of what I believe are these certain large reoccurring themes in the interrogation of the species, in interrogation of violence, interrogation of um, the self, in a sense. But I, in Germany, what I, one of the projects I did, which is, com is coming up, is it's an analysis of um, a Ruki Meinhof, who was part of the bottom, one of the most violent um, so-called terrorist organizations in Germany at the time. I isolate her out specifically because she was a humanist and a feminist and an extraordinary writer, and I juxtapose that context against the context of today, performatively. So I think I'm using going back to the terms of violence that are transacted in um, when the wall was up in Berlin and at the height of, there was more violent terrorist organizations, terrorists as used with quotes, um, were led by women 
during this period than any other time, and it's gone unnoted. And so I'm focusing on the feminism of and the intelligence of these women to orchestrate as a means, these are intelligence where they saw other possibilities, but they chose this possibility. So why? And what does that mean contemporarily? I think that the crisis I spoke of at the beginning, and I, I know this is a long answer to your question, but I don't think anyone noticed. I think we can complain and we can whine to ourselves about we don't like this that Trump's doing, and we don't, we're worried about abortion, we're worried about the environment, we're worried about the Supreme Court. We're, I mean, we've got a list of things that we're all worried about. Gay rights, we're, I mean, we're worried about everything. We're worried about um, all these things we're worried about, but my basic conclusion from traveling this country as much as I do, which is often, pretty much everyone's lives is about the same. I haven't noticed too much difference in the daily lives of people that object to the Trump administration. So the question is, is at what moment do we arrive when people either are going to wait this out because you know what, this country will survive Trump, to be perfectly honest. It might not be the same country at the end, but we will survive him. He's a temporary, it's temporary. We survive, I remember Nixon. I was of age of Nixon, I remember Nixon. We survived Nixon. You know, people forget Reagan and Reaganomics. We survived Reagan. We survived Bush. Okay, this is a more extreme version of that, but that's a reflection of the time that we live in. I'm not saying we should wait this out, but I think if people are actually gonna oppose and resist Trump, then my suggestion of Bataille and Breton is a counter-revolutionary revolution has to happen. A counter-thinking, a counter-intellect has to appear in order to, to realize that he's not stupid and he is not surrounded himself by a bunch of idiots. They might not act like it, but believe me, there are things that have to be going on here that we are not aware of because we're asked to look at everything else but what we're supposed to be looking at. It's just my opinion. I, I, I'm not a, like I said, I'm not a political analyst. I don't pretend to be. I'm analyzing this from an aesthetic point of view. I'm an analyzing it from a cultural point of view. I, I'm not gonna say I'm right, but I don't think I'm wrong either. <laughs> you know. Can I just make one more question? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, that we keep making the same mistake in relation to the culture wars, and I wonder if you can elaborate more in that and if love has to do with anything in relation to that mistake. That's an interesting, what I mean by that is that, um, I'll skip the first culture war, which won't make much sense to you if I can tell, I can sort of see you by your age, so that might, but it would be the 70s, and it was, it was, a, it was a battle of a different type, so it, it really didn't make much sense. But the culture war of the, the second culture war that I would identify, which you will have probably heard of or read about or know something of, it began first as one, as I suggested, that had to do, why, the reason I say love is because it's about love. It's simply about the ability to love whoever you choose to love. It's about actually the manifestation of an emotion, of an attachment to something that is greater than anything else. It supersedes profit, it supersedes the material acquisition, it supersedes one's job, it supersedes everything else. It's, 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 it's something that we as human beings, it's, it's, not, it's mandatory. We are a species that requires human interaction and love. So the, the shutting down of that, right, in the culture war, it began as one that was censorship and homophobia, but it turned on a dime. So the late 80s, my friends and I that fought in that war, and we fought in that war, we either were protesting, intervent, in, having interventions into this landscape, or we were at funerals. I lost, we lost track of how many people died of AIDS in the late 80s. Just completely lost track of that. Up to 92, it pivots. 92, you have Rodney King. The beating of Rodney King, that's when we still had old fashioned video cameras. And that video played over and over and over again and over and over and over again. Visual evidence of someone being beaten to the ground and these officers are acquitted, visual evidence. Okay, now I'm not gonna say there's truth in photography or truth in video, but you know what? 
that was pretty clear what happened in the Rodney King video. And if you don't remember the Rodney King video, I ask you to go back and look it on Google, I mean on YouTube, because it is there, and you tell me what you see. <laughs> I don't even have to tell you what I see, but you, can, you tell me what you see. And, what, and, the, and the result of that beating was the, we loved a riot in Los Angeles, by the way. So that was a, the, the, the 1992 riots occurred because of, the, of that, of what happened during that court case. So it pivots from a discourse on sexuality and censorship and love, and it pivots to one of racial violence. It pivots immediately to the, the, this, to the, the, the a, a, a war, the, the, a, a race war that's occurring in this country that no one wants to acknowledge, right? An open war, right? So now you escalate that up in time, what I just, I showed you only one image, right? I could have shown you 50 of how many black people have been shot Without you know, without probable cause, right? I mean, regardless of the of the of the of the of the suggestion of how these things occur, I'm not, I can't speak to every one of them by any means. But just simply look at the paradox, look at the look at the the replication of the action, right? And look at the, the circumstances of these things. So, but by the end of the by by the end of '93, see, we thought we were at one point, we were, we believed we were winning, we believed that we were just far enough to tip the tide in this country where the idea of social justice actually had a possibility of existing. It was possible at that moment where one fragment of a second, one just millisecond, we believed that the, you could redeem the history of this country. And, and in that belief, simultaneous to that, bam, it ended. We lost. We lost everything. By the end of the 93 biennial, we knew we lost. There was no, we could not resurrect that battle at that war at that time. It was impossible. And the, and the disillusionment and the response to that is the, the ultra-conservative right-wing response to that which occurred in the later 90s. And hence the birth of the art market in the beginning of the 21st century in terms of art making. It went completely to a business model. It went to completely to a conservative model. It went, everything shifted. Everything went against the previous ideology. So we lo what I mean by reoccurring theme in the culture wars is we keep losing, is what I'm suggesting. We keep repeating the same structure of attack over and over again. So I'm using Breton again. You have to have a counter, counter argument. <laughs> I'm not kidding with this. I'm not making, I'm not, this is not hyper, hyperbole. This is not, I'm, I'm actually suggesting a strategic tool here. Because if we just do the same thing, I tell you what has never happened, ever, <laughs> is as much as I support it 1,000%, everyone should protest every, set, every city, every place in this country, nothing politically has ever changed by protest alone. So what are the tools that you could activate that change things? I, 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 it's a longer discussion, it's a deeper discussion, but I, I advocate for, you know, in the end, I, I just, I... I advocate for love because, I, like I said, everything but love and gravity. <laughs> they become, how do you get up every day? What do you hang on to as an ethos of who and what you are? How do you get up every day knowing what is occurring in the world? How do you get up every day knowing that we are basically living in this country unaffected by most of the crises that occur everywhere else in the world? because we live in the empire. We're protected by the empire, therefore we benefit from living in the empire. That's why no one is too much at a, in, worried at the particular moment, because it doesn't quite affect anybody too much. Some people, yes, more than others, of course, naturally. I say that not as a criticism, I say that as a, basically as a, as a kind of wake-up call. Because you, can, you cannot, if, if this is a war and this is an, there's an enemy to be identified, which is a little binary and a little essentialized, but nonetheless, if that's the case, if that's what we're describing this as being, then no one's paying attention to the war. <laughs> you have to pay attention, which means you have to risk something. I would, as into this gentleman's question, I would argue I've, my entire life, risked something. I have not traveled an easy path to the type of work that I make, nor the discussion that I choose to be engaged in critically, ongoingly. I will not back down from this discussion. I simply won't do it. I won't do it for the ATM pin number that I could be given. If I went another direction, I won't do it to calm down because I'm 
not as young as I used to be. I won't do it because I simply, I, I ethically will not do. I'm not, I refuse. I just simply refuse. What can I be, what are they going to offer me? What? I think that, I mean, there's, there's a, the, the path that we follow is important. That's all. That's, I hope that's some, I hope that's some part of your question I answered. So, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you staying. Thank you.